This video is about a filmmaking workshop, but first, a little backstory. I'll be quick. Tom Swindell is a very accomplished filmmaker who's made his name making award-winning documentaries for the BBC, Netflix, and filming for Vice. He's also made numerous music videos. Recently, I caught up with Tom in Cardiff at the University of South Wales, where he was putting on a workshop for the students in preparation for a shoot for Channel 5. As I was there, I shot a little BTS so I could share some of Tom's insights with you. So yeah, first of all, I'll get my main backdrop set up. I tend to like to get everything out and ready, and then I start to position it. So this will that'll actually be my B camera, but I'll put that up and I'll start to get my lights going now. So light has changed quite a lot over the years. Lights used to be seriously hot and literally you would fake people and um, some of them would give off buzzes as well, like a kind of a like kind of sound from the ballast. So I had some difficult times when I started with that. Nowadays you've got a lot of other options. The LED lights have actually got, got pretty good these days. So I um, quite often use these LED lights now that don't create the heat and the intensity for the subject. Because today we're in this amazing studio, but to be frank, a lot of the time, you know, you'd be setting up in someone's house. This is, this is a brand new C stand that I've just brought yesterday. Um, that, that's not working, so we want to turn it around. Yeah, on the big leg. And it's good to like calculate what's around you. In my early days, I had a job in Tate Modern in the Tate stores. Luckily, I had the idea to kind of calculate. I checked the distance of the stand if it had fallen, if it would hit the painting or not, and I've done that before, and it did go down that day. And the technicians came around the corner after hearing the smash, and they creeped around the corner like, because they didn't, they didn't want to even look after hearing that sound. Uh, so yeah, this is a nice little film for you. <coughs> but it was, it was, it was. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, it was that I got. I, I did do health and safety courses with the BBC because when they first met me, uh, they thought, "Oh my God, this guy's from the streets. He's gonna. Well, this is just a walking liability. It's going to be a big, a big issue." So they put me through all these courses, and it just teaches you to kind of um, think ahead and to calculate problems like that. So you kind of assess the risk. So the risk is the light might hit the painting. So you assess it, and then you make sure that you put uh, something in place to stop that risk from happening. And the thing I put in place was the fact that I made that distance. So health and safety sounds boring, but it can be like, save you from a hundred million pound lawsuit that I'd never get out of. Um, so this is gonna be my, um, my key light. Again, with most things, it is literally like a suck it and see situation. Like when I brought this, I didn't know how to put it together. I just kind of roughly worked it out. So before this, I was actually using polys and I was um, bouncing the light off the polys, which gave like a much more softer light. However, the pressure on this, on this particular production just started increasing. So what do you do when pressure increases? It was too much pressure for me having to change the lighting all the time and I'd have to move the poly board and then I'd have to move the light and you know it was getting too much for me so you couldn't find ways to make it less stressful so when me and Vivian were setting up these we were, we were originally making like three big long ones like that but then it means every time you're on a movie you literally need two humans on either side that's gonna you're gonna lose too much time so we compromise and we've just gone for these little strips Again, this light was a bit of a compromise, but because it's a direct light, if you need to adjust it, you just tweak it. Whereas when you're working with bouncing, you always gotta like, think about the way the light's hitting and coming back, so there's more angles to, to make it harder for you. Also, because it's a program about hate crime, they want quite a moody feel, which means you know, you're working with quite a lot of shadow. But I tend to use these musician mic stands. So these you can buy for like 15 quid from uh, any kind of music shop. I just adapt them. Um, there are other ways, more pro ways of doing it, but this tends to work for me. 
Um, so like I said, at the moment the process is get everything out. So you've got all your elements ready to play with. And then this is the last thing I actually bring in. The mic, the windbreaker. You don't need those inside. Sometimes you see people using them inside, but they're idiots. So don't do that. Just clean the sound. Yes. I, I put a fuzzy ball in front of it. Yeah, you can, you can use them inside if you've got like an AC or wind attacking you, but this will be fine like that. Counterweight is good, so we probably want a little sandbag on the end of this. Just to have a little mic. Good thing about sound is it doesn't actually change that much. Mm -hmm. Like in my career, it's kind of just stayed the same, really. There are some advances, but not many. It was called a 416, that was the industry workhorse. You could buy one second hand, I'm sure, for pretty cheap because there were so many used in television. Uh, in more recent years, in the last 15 years, this other companies came out. This is an Australian company called Rode. They're just a bit cheaper because everybody knows the Germans make good gear, but you know, because everybody knows that, they charge for it as well, so you can find. I think the first thing we'll do is get our big backlight ready now. Some people call it like a crown light, as in, you know, top of your head. They're normally quite hard to do. I quite often do them with dados, but they, they're quite hard to get over the top of the backdrops in most studios where I set up. But we've got the luxury here of being in a professional studio. So in a way, we want to turn our mains off for a second, so if someone wants to do that. Turn actually, do you want to let's, tie, let's tidy all these away, actually, to the corner so that they're a bit safer for now, now that they've been built. Less trip hazards. Right. So... I can bring those lights up if you want. I think that will probably be what's going to happen, what, what we'll need. So, does someone else want to do this? Sorry. Yeah. So we always drag someone in. So you're often grabbing a producer or an assistant or assistant producer, grabbing them in to see if you can get that, that sitting. Now, the reason this is super important for us, right, is some people might turn up wearing black. Now, we, we normally warn people, don't wear white, don't wear black and things like this, but it doesn't always happen. Um, so say if you've got a very dark backdrop and you've got a guy wearing a black jacket, He's, there's no definition, so he just disappears into the backdrop. Now, all rules can be broken, you know, in a creative manner, so you might want that for some creative expression, but in general, you don't want that. If he's got a black jacket on, we want this definition. So having this little bit of light will just give you like a, 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 like a what you call a rim light or an edge, so you can define the, the two things against one another. So... Do you want the light back, or...? Do you know what? Um, let's take it up a little bit so we've got a little bit of grace, but we actually do normally want quite a distance yeah. from, from the backdrop, so I'm, I'm not too bothered, but I think, I think we'll have it up a bit just in case. Yeah, that's, that's good there. You want um, the intensity up or down? Or? Uh, I'll have to wait until my camera's yeah, on, sure. actually. Um, and we get your others out there. Oh yes, monitor. Uh, was there a monitor oh, available, yeah. perhaps? So if you guys use FS7, a message has come up and it's saying, please execute APR. If you get something like that and you don't understand it, whack it into Google, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I couldn't do that when I was starting because, like, there would really be no answer. But I, I know what it means. It means you've got to do what's called a black balance. So that means you've got to put your lens cap on. You can press this button here, execute APR. And it's like an auto system. It's, it's the camera's learning what jet black is. I'm using ND fader indoors. It seems a bit weird because you've got three or four NDs there and I've got lights that I can adjust so why would I want an ND fader on here but they're actually very good for people um, of African descent who have skin that actually you can have with black skin you can have a problem with reflections because you can kind of get a lot of reflections and then you end up with kind of like big white patches so polarizing filters can actually help reduce reflections 
So a lot of the people in this program are, uh, you know, Somalian origin, uh, West African origin. So this helps kind of reduce those, those little white highlights. I've decided to, to not use S-Log. There's another reason I'm not using S-Log because S-Log takes you to 2000 ISO, which means it's quite noisy. So I've burnt in a LUT inside the camera in the monitor LUT section, and I've took my ISO down to 500. S-Log is invented for, for example, say you're in Brooklyn and it's like midday in the summer and there's African-American guy and the light's hitting right above his head and his face is in shadow. It's designed for that kind of situation, really high contrast situations. When you've got a controllable situation like a studio here, you can um, control the contrast and the light yourself. You don't need S-Log to do that. S-Log's just going to give you noise and it's going to put your work in the hands of someone else. So, time check. That's something that's super important because there's never enough time to do these things. Okay, we'll move on to the key light for now. Let's just see if this is working. I'll put a light on full power and then back physically walk it away from the subject. Lighting, you're basically mimicking the sun most of the time. So that's why it's always on a high angle. On this particular program, I'm normally creating some shadow on one side of the face. So, but there's this kind of magic spot you can get you see, you see where, where his cheek has just got just that one little bit of light there, so you can just catch the second eye, but you're kind of playing, you're really playing on, on, on the edge of it. So, sorry, talk, look, look into me now. That's great. So, and I, 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 every yeah, face is... You. you can see what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, so I'll zoom in a bit so you can see it a bit better. So, just um, got that this would be the area to look. Light. Hitting his cheek, everybody's cheeks are different, of course. Isn't it? Everybody's face is different. It's always a different challenge. So with this gentleman, eyebrows are quite strong. So you might want to come lower to kind of get in there. Whereas someone else, you might be able to light from above and you'll get to their eye. In that, I get the director to talk to them at first. So how was the train journey? How was all that? And I just watch how they're moving. And then, okay, he, he, for example, he might be shy and doesn't like looking at the director very much. So he's always actually looking at the floor over there. And then it's a total adjustment because they're not looking where you'd expect them to look. Um, and we often say, you know, can you look to this? I put this up there because that's roughly where a director would be. Or I put my handle up there so you can test there what we call the eye line. The eye line's super, super important. If an eye line's kind of out here, it's going to have that kind of bad, disengaged eye line that doesn't feel intimate to the camera. It's kind of off. Now, like I said, of all these rules, you can break them completely, like, you know, but it's good to kind of know the rough rules so you can know when you want to break them. Because when you break the rules, you normally got to break them hard. So you wouldn't put like an in-between eye line like this, but you might be like a really snazzy Netflix documentary and you decide to do something completely different like the director here, and it's a completely different side angle. Now, everything can film, it all goes into psychology. So what happens is if you turn your chair and look this way, what happens if me and him are having a conversation like this? I have no clue if I can focus on anything. What happens here? What are you suddenly? You are a passive observer. You're not part of it. You're suddenly, you're a voyeur. Yeah. You're looking in, you know, you're sat in a cafe and you're hearing someone else having a chat and you're having a little listen. So you can play with the psychology of things through lighting, camera position, all that kind of stuff. So you consider your documentary's theme and they say, okay, how am I going to play with this? Is it a documentary about spies in Berlin? Okay, maybe I want it to have this espionage feel or, you know, or is it about um, plastic surgery? Maybe I want this like space age uh, feel and have it all ultra bright and, you know, well lit or... Yes, that looks great, actually, this guy, yeah, you know. And then it depends the character. Like, this guy looks, he's just... He looks wicked in a profile. Do you always want make out to make everything look beautiful? Is that the aim of the game? Not necessarily. You could end up doing a Savotsky crystal advert for five million with the top lenses in the world, and, and I wouldn't give a shit. I'd just change the channel because it's of no interest to me. But it looks at the ultimate highest level of beauty in cinematography. So beauty is something that you're working with, but um, you shouldn't worship it. You should kind of understand it and know because ugly's interesting too, and distortion's interesting too, filth, 
grain, dirt, is just as interesting as, as clarity and high quality and all that. They, they all have their power to affect the human mind in a different way when we're looking at a moving image. I picked up this thing off Roger Deakins, who did a little interview, and he said something really interesting. He said about this, which is the classic documentary thing. He said, when would you ever do that? He said this, when I'm talking about the psychology of lenses and stuff like that, he said that, you, 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 when do you ever, hi mate, you're right up there? We're like, when do we talk like this? We don't. If, if, if I was chilling with you in a calf, we'd be sat like this, opposite each other. Or we'd be on a bus next to each other. But like, how's it going, mate? Yeah, you know, we'd be talking like that. So he was saying that this is a bit of a fallacy in a way. Um, this kind of idea of using a long lens because it might look beautiful or it kind of compresses the image and gives you a good depth of field. It's not very natural to a human. So you want to think about how close your camera is as is, is well. Now, maybe, may, maybe, maybe you want that distance because it's about, um, a, you know, a lawyer or a politician and you want that coldness, you know. Um, but maybe it's a, it's a grandma and she's on a sofa and, and, and you want it to feel like you're her best friend sitting next to her. So if you use a wider lens and come in closer, you feel more friendly with the subject matter. And then depends on, you know, there's also cultural themes and norms. So hip hop, you know, has an association with wide lenses and an association with like low, low and wide. So if I'm doing like a big hip hop star and he's got like a big, you know, what, what's he wearing? Is he wearing a super cool, expensive jacket? Uh, you know, maybe I might be quite wide and low and look up to him and give him that kind of sense of power. If it's BBC Four, you might do one style. You know, if it's Vice, you can't use tripods. You can't really do things like this. They would want me to, to be, you know, uh, traveling on a train with this guy somewhere and just asking him a few questions whilst you're on a train, just so it looks more spontaneous and feels more natural. Let's get a couple of dados. Uh, maybe one, one right down the back there, behind the main backdrop. I mean, you try and plug lights in independently if you can, so then you don't have too many going from one source. We've really got to find the one that corresponds. There's these different size holes, so try, try that one. That might be too big. Let's see if it grips. But quite a lot of mistakes can be made literally by walking away from something and it's not, um, it's not been done up properly. That's why we always check, then double check. Yes. Definitely, and put out on the longer leg. Right, so now we want to get a flag in there. Uh, so let's go for the biggest ones, actually, for now. And then you just use a much smaller slot. So one of these? Yeah. It is actually easier with two people. So this is to control spill. So obviously I'm trying to light the, um, our subject here. Can someone get me a sandbag, actually, another sandbag? The bag is now the, the stand-in. Um, thank you, I'll just pop that back there. So, you see on, see the big red backdrop now? Again, getting a lot darker, so I, I can kind of cut that off and mean that the light will just hit our subject there. So these flags are amazing, especially if you're doing this kind of dark and scary backdrops like we're doing here today. Um, so now, the dados we can start to get creative with. We want to try, try bringing in some more layers of backdrop. So this is so that you can have like different tones of red. So I can bring in one of these and um, not light it, but then I can light the one behind it and then you'll get like a dark red and then like a medium red. We also have a bit of an issue because there's two cameras filming which means one of the cameras is going to come on a bit of an angle, which could mean if your contributor's here, your second angle could end up coming like that, and you've got no backdrop at all because there's your backdrop. So I might even get you guys to make me another one of these for the second camera. Because the problem with the two-camera system is, man, you can light it and get it all great for A camera, and then you look at B camera and it just looks absolutely terrible. So. It's, it's kind of a bit, bit of a compromise. But I always light everything for camera A first. This is a focuser. I don't know if you know about that. And you know to be careful with these lights because they get stupidly hot, right? They're not too bad now, but, but later on they'll be very dangerous. So this bit here can get a bit hot. So I tend to 
put them out to the wide side, then I get the, I take these two doors to the, out and I put this one down and then you can make what I call a creative slash. So I, I, I quite often do things like that and make these little strips out of them. So I could do something like that. So if we go back to our camera now. So we always whoop, fully extend these. Yeah, that's a health and safety thing again, because um, remember in school when you used to make, I don't know, they still just make batteries and coil wires together. Yeah, so when you coil metal together, it's, um, it creates build up energy so it basically can get very hot. Um, it's not going to be a problem with one dado light in it, but if you are running big, big lights off it and a gaffer electrician caught you with an unextended um, cable like that, you could get into trouble. So that, that's part of the... <coughs> so even if you don't need to extend it, you just unravel it. If you've got one bolt, it's going to slosh about all the time and then you're going to have big problems. And doing these interviews, you don't want a sloshy camera, you want it rock solid. Um, so there's one bolt on this, but I'm not that happy about that. Okay. Yeah, well this is called a T-bar, you can buy them online, it's like a much better, because you can really get a lot of like torque into it, so and it's, that's, that's really worth getting off um, Amazon or something. You can't, you can't get them anywhere else really, you have to get them on the internet. I'll put it in the centre, right, because in the centre it grips better. If it's up there or down there, it's going to give you more, yeah. more yeah. problems. That's more, more blurred. Now, put it on an angle, so if you keep the light the same, but angle this, so it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty um, vivid, isn't it? It's not um, really, um, no, it's too, it's too much, eh? Because there's still quite a bit of light here in it. I know, I feel like it's, a ruler would help. Yeah. Um, so, do you want to get a C-stand? Kind of like put it into shadow and reveal it. Yeah, there's your sweet spot. Can you nice. Know, there. Yeah, see, so I'm clearing that up now by creating a shadow and putting it over there. So that's lens flare, essentially. I'm going to try this cable to see if mm -hmm. it's last one. Yeah. That's a bit weird. Uh, we've got the um, Tilt it a little bit. So you've always got to check your um, monitor settings as well. Don't light the blackboard though, bro. Look out. Yeah. So a lot of your life is full of this stuff. So if you ever can, learn the equipment first. Try to, and then it'll save you time. Cool. That's much more like it now.